I want you to turn over to the Gospel of John. There is some cool stuff that Jesus had to say that sometimes we miss about parenthood. Um, all of us don't have and haven't had and or have good memories or the raising of parents. And some of us have been very blessed to have that. Jesus knows you. And He knows what you are going through right now in your personal life. And He knows how you were raised and whether Mother's Day is a good day for you or a sad day for you. And we do it again next month for Father's Day. But He cares deeply for everyone, equally the same. And He, he shares in His words that He leaves us with, the greatest thing that any parent wants of their children. And what is that? It's to succeed, isn't it? To be useful, to be satisfied, to be assured of life, to have the salvation that could come to save them from something bad happening in, in their life. Um, the first day of school, I was living in a little town of Roaming Rock, Ohio. The bus came and I ran to the cornfield and hid. Uh, my mother come and got me after she figured out I didn't get on the bus. I was in kindergarten. Took me to school and said, you got to go. And I thought she was the meanest person who had ever lived on the face. I was convinced she was going to let me stay home. But mom knew I needed to go. Now, she wasted her effort, but anyway, I got through school. Why did she want me to go to school? Because she knew that for a life that was going to be useful to myself and to be useful for the people around and to be a part of society, I needed to learn some things. I needed to be ready when the challenges came. I needed to be prepared the best of my ability that she could help with, or my dad, either one, for the challenges ahead. Now Devin, in his communion thoughts, already preached most of this sermon, so I don't have to go very much of it. <coughs> From day one, and he said that, and he prayed about it, from day one, before the beginning of time, Jesus and His Father had a plan how to get each of us prepared to live an successful life for eternity. Not just for this short time, this illusion here on earth. I never met my grandmother on my mother's side. Is that your paternal grandmother? Is that how you say that? Maternal. The father is the grandmother. I met her. Okay, I got you. Maternal grandmother. I never met her. The woman had 14 girls and 6 boys and 63 grandchildren. And I'm a part of those 63 grandchildren. And I don't know how many great-grandchildren lost track. Now that's a pretty good-sized family, don't you think? Think about our Almighty Father. He knew that there would be billions of people alive who needed salvation. And all throughout the Old Testament, which is so hard to read and so boring, most of it, he says, I want no one to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why will you die, O house of Israel? He's calling everybody the house of Israel. He's begging for them to learn the truth and to be obedient. I had to learn obedience at school. I had to learn obedience at work. I had to learn obedience in my car. I had to learn obedience everywhere you go. There's someone to obey. And God's begging us and has been from day one to be obedient. I'm going to share with you just a few verses here out of John. Then we're going to share a few more that I've shared every Mother's Day. You ought to have these memorized after 13 times. This is number 14. 
Jesus is preparing us to be ready. Turn with me to chapter 7. And as he is uh, in the midst of this battle between the, the leaders of the day, the spiritual leaders of the day, it just continually goes from one thing to another. He's continually wore out from having to teach his children. I, I was with Callie and Keaton last night in a vehicle for an hour and a half. It, I was wore out. I can't imagine living with them too. Christ is, Jesus wore out these things. <coughs> In verse 37 of John chapter 7, he has been bickering with these folks forever. And this is what he, he's just finally tired of it, and he says this. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus has came to Jerusalem, it's the Feast of the Booths. And this whole week he's been arguing with these dudes. This is the last day of the thing for everybody goes home. And he says this, if any man is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus is preparing and has prepared for the day when the Spirit of God is going to come and live inside of us. And we, we have that yearning. And I, I even though I don't know your situation, you didn't grow up in my house either. It may not have been perfect every day with mom. Probably wasn't. But as I've heard already twice this morning, there is something inside of us that still thinks or reacts to that emotion, and it is an emotion, that brings back the comfort of mom. Whether it was your physical mother or to the person who raised you, there is some assurance and comfort and peace. And that knowledge of I am home when I'm here. And that's what Jesus is going to do for us when we indeed accept him as Lord and Savior. It hasn't happened. He's preparing these people just as he prepares us. When you do make that decision and when that comes to your life, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a life that is so full of freedom, of that peace, of that nurturing, that you won't be able to contain it and it will flow from you to others. Skip over to chapter 8 and go to verse 12. John 8, 12. We're going to read quite a bit down to 47. I'll read fast. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You are bearing witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. And Jesus said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You people judge according to the flesh, and I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it. But I and he who sent me. Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two or three is true, I am he who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. 
And so they were saying to him, Where is your father? And Jesus said, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury. As he taught in the temple, no one seized him because his hour has not yet come. And therefore again to them, I go away and you'll seek me and you will die in your sin. And where I'm going, you cannot come. Therefore the Jews were saying, Surely he will not kill himself, will he? Where I'm going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, You are from below, and I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. I said, and I said therefore to you, You shall die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Skip down to verse 31. Jesus therefore was saying to those Jews who had believed, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And he answered, them, he answered him, We are Abraham's offspring, and we have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you shall become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, that means reality, this is the real thing. I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. If therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's offspring, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak these things which I have seen with my father. Therefore you also do the things which you have heard from your father. And they said and answered to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If Abraham's children do the deeds of Abraham, that is, for you, you're seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, that Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. When he said to him, We are not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but He sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? Is it because you cannot hear my word? You are your father, the devil. And you want the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you don't believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. That is an argument. That is an eternal argument that will be brought up on the day of judgment when Jesus returns or you and I die. That you and I are going to be placed in the middle of these words. And there will be a whole pile of people, and I don't want to be one and you don't either. That's going to stand there on that day and you're going to argue just like these guys are doing. Because we thought we were fine and we never examined the truth for the truth and we never gave up our own spirit to let the Spirit of God come and live inside of us and truly make that change of life that leads to eternal life. Jesus is being awful harsh with these men. He will be even worse when He comes. Now I read this, and it's a long passage, and I normally don't read that much, but I want us to understand something so clearly. There is freedom. There is freedom in Jesus that no other thing, place, or purpose on earth can achieve. We are enslaved to sin, and we don't even know it. If we can't come to grips with the reality that any sin that is not reconciled through the blood of Christ is going to send us to hell forever. Any sin. 
I just want to read one more thing. Turn with me over to Galatians. You know these words. And as Jesus talked about His Father and who our Father is and what our Father does, and He enlightens us about the Spirit, Paul writes this letter to a bunch of Jewish people who are trying to make everybody Jews before they become a Christian. It's like trying to make everybody a Cubs fan before they can go to a baseball game. It just ain't going to happen. Not only that, it isn't right. That's funny. There's fun. But the truth of the matter is, I want to put conditions on what makes me free, not God's conditions on what makes me free. I don't want God just messing with my life. I just want Him enough of my life that I feel comfortable with Him and that I have a relationship with Him. That is not at all scriptural. When Jesus talks about the living water that's going to come and live in us for eternity, that's the Spirit of God that comes to us, and that Spirit comes to us through our baptism. The Bible is very clear about that. There are certain people who were given the Spirit without being baptized, but very few. Over and over and over again in the New Testament we are talked about the gift of the Spirit coming through and after our baptism. And as that Spirit comes to us, He starts doing, and I, we use the word He, because the Bible does, but actually, the Spirit actually acts more like our mother. But there's no reason that He, the Spirit of God, can't act like our mother. What's the Spirit of God do? He trains us. Our Bible teaches us that He trains us to learn right from wrong. He protects us. Over in 1 John, we learn that Satan can no longer touch us whatsoever in our lives, no way, shape, or form, if in truly the Spirit is living within us. He feeds us. How does the Spirit feed us? Well, the Spirit feeds us in many ways. Through the Word, through our prayer life, through intermingling with one another. And when the body of Christ is together, the Spirit of Christ is there, there's the encouragement that comes. And here these people are, they've changed the whole deal. It isn't anymore about Christ. Now they, they're reverting back to trying to be a Jew first and then a Christian. And Paul is just sick of it. He writes this letter. In chapter 4, verse 21 of Galatians, he says these words. Now, let's, re, let's refer to the law as a man-made man institution or a man-derivative thought of what it takes to be, to be in graces with God and to attain salvation. Paul writes, Do you tell me do you want to be under the law? Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are of two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. As Paul refers to the intimate death brought by the law, he also brings about the intimate freedom found in Christ. And he calls that freedom our mother. And actually, it's the Spirit of God. It's that Spirit of salvation, of security, of knowing my destiny, of knowing that I'm prepared for whatever's coming and that no one's going to hurt me. That school bus rolled up in front of that house, and I looked in there and I ran because I was scared. And I didn't want to get on it. 
Jesus interrupts our way of thinking and our manly, our earthly way of thinking. And he says to us, there is nothing going to happen to you that I cannot deal with. And we gain strength. And we get on that bus. And we change. The key is change for the best. I probably could have flowed a fit the next day and not got on the bus, but I didn't. I went. And I'm glad I did. But more importantly, I am glad that somebody introduced me to the mother of my spiritual life. The mother of these words that guide. The power of the Holy Spirit to protect. And it all comes through our acceptance of Jesus. It's time to go. And as the folks come back forward to sing with us, I just pray you think about who is my spiritual mother today? Am I just going along with the earthly ways with that mother from the desert dealing in man's confidence in himself? Or am I a child of the spiritual mother who is truly leading me to salvation? Who is leading me through the living water of life? Eternal life. Not for the day, but for every day forever. Jesus spoke those long words in John 8. Go back and read them. It says to those men, You are not from the Father. You think you are because you were born a Jew. He says, You don't get it. Your father is Satan. Those words I don't want to ever hear from me, and I know you don't want to hear them either. It came out of Jesus' mouth. He's coming to visit again. Are you ready to stand there with him and go with him? I pray you are. If not, let his words and let his spirit teach you the ways of eternity. We invite you to come and join the great family of God. We're going to stand and sing this invitation song. And if today's the day you'd like to do that, great. We'd love to do that. But more importantly, we'd like to visit with you. If you would like to visit... Those of you who are visiting with us, we're glad you're here. Those who are with us regularly, we're really glad you all are here. We need to be with our mother, that spiritual one, the one that's going to live in that new Jerusalem. Let's sing. If you've got a decision to make, we ask you to come.